Stephen R. Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families, Building a Beautiful Culture in a Turbulent World. Imagine you're about to take a flight. You check with the pilot where you're going to be flying today. He replies, no idea. We're going to take off, follow the wind, and land wherever we fancy. You'd no doubt be pretty worried, scared even, and chances are you're not getting on that flight. Just as an airplane needs a destination and a flight plan, a family should also have an idea of its purpose and destination. Sure, it may drift off course from time to time, but with a clear vision of that destination, it can keep coming back to the flight plan for guidance and be sure that it'll arrive safely. Hey, my name's Amanda, and in this blink to The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families by Stephen Covey, I'm going to walk you through each of these seven habits. Along the way, I'll provide some hints and tips on how you can put them into practice in your day-to-day life as you and your family strive to become highly effective together. Habit one of seven, be proactive. Okay, so almost everyone has heard of the psychiatrist Viktor Frankl. He spent World War II in a Nazi concentration camp. There, he endured horrific experiments at the hands of his captors and witnessed the deaths of family members. Many captives, understandably, gave up in the face of such conditions. But, he observed, others were carrying out acts of kindness. Some even gave fellow inmates their last scraps of food. He realized there was one thing that couldn't be taken away from any man or woman, their freedom to choose how they respond to their circumstances. Between anything that happens to us and our response, there's a space. In that time, we're free to choose how we respond. What we choose ultimately affects how we grow and our happiness. As newborn babies, we don't have much possibility to choose. But as we grow, we develop what Covey calls four unique human gifts. And these gifts are self-awareness, or the ability to evaluate our thoughts, actions, and lives, conscience, our inner voice of what is ethical and moral, imagination, our ability to envision a future different from our past, and finally, independent will, how we respond to our genes and our environment. Instead of simply being responsive, we can use these gifts to make what we can from life, take responsibility for how we respond, and take steps towards shaping our own future. In short, Be proactive. To be proactive is the first and most important of the seven habits. Mastering it is key to unlocking the power of the others. So we better cover some techniques to optimize your proactivity. (laughs) First, you got to focus on things you can do something about rather than on things outside of your control. Think of the words of St. Francis of Assisi. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Then, make sure you always use proactive language. Instead of saying or even thinking things like, oh, my grandfather and father behave like that, so I do too, change your whole attitude and say, they acted like that, but I choose not to. Remember to pause, think, and choose. Press the pause button between anything that happens to you and how you respond. Think about the possible proactive responses and choose the response with the best consequences. And uh, don't forget the gift of humor. Laugh, smile, and have fun when you can. You can even laugh at your own mistakes and clumsiness, and in fact, you should. And finally, as Gandhi said, we should be the change we want to see in others. So start by being proactive yourself and then inspire your family to be proactive too. Habit two of seven. Begin with the end in mind. Imagine you're on a construction site. You approach some of the workers and ask them what they're building. No idea, they say. You ask to see the blueprint. We don't have one, says the supervisor. We're building as we go and figuring it out along the way. So you ask what purpose the building will serve. We don't know yet, they reply. When you think of your family in the same way, without a blueprint, how can you know where your family is heading, what it's for, and what it's trying to achieve? 
what you need is a family mission statement. And this is where the second habit, begin with the end in mind, comes in. Creating a mission statement for your family needs some dedicated, uninterrupted time, but can be accomplished in three steps. First, brainstorm the purpose, values, and dreams of your family together. Ask yourselves what you want to be and do as a family. What are your goals? Where are you heading? What are your family values? Everyone should share their ideas. The more involvement, the more buy-in and commitment. Accept all ideas at this stage without judgment, no matter how wacky they may seem. Think possibilities, not limitations. Second step, combine the ideas into a single set of expressions that capture everything about your family. Perfection is not necessary, but it is important to write things down. You can always revisit the statements later. Write whatever fits for your family, whether that includes statements like, Our mission is to respect and accept each other's talents. Or something more simple like, our mission is to love and help each other. Or, our family has fun together. The third step is to use your mission statement to keep your family on track. Put it where you can all see it. You might even want to frame it. Use it to guide your family in all that you do. When you stray from it, come back to it to correct your course. And make sure that you revise and update your statement as your family's needs and desires develop and the issues it faces change. Habit three of seven, put first things first. Okay, I'd like you to think for a moment about things that matter to you and how you'd rank them. So most people put their relationships at the top of the list. Family, friends, pets, work colleagues, and God, for example. Next, they usually list their values, freedom, trust, loyalty, integrity, and so on. And only at the end do they think about objects like cars, houses, cell phones, and other less tangible things like their job, leisure activities, or any side projects. But the stark reality is that when it comes to allocating your time, you probably don't spend enough time developing your relationships, less time pursuing your values, And what is actually taken over your time are those things at the end of your priorities. What you say isn't always what you do. So, the third habit is to put first things first. Make your family and your relationships your top priority. To help you achieve this, put some systems in place which help you sustain effective results. But keep them flexible and family-friendly while maintaining some kind of order. The Coveys had what they call their four big rock family systems. Have regular family mealtimes to help you eat more healthily and aid better family communication. Other researched and proven benefits include less risky behavior from teens such as drug and alcohol use, better mental health for the whole family, and better grades for the kids. Set aside at least one hour on a mutually convenient, consistent day for weekly family time. Nothing will provide your family with more opportunity to build relationships. Use it to review your schedules, solve family problems, and perhaps even a time for a little teaching by one of the children. Whatever you do, make it fun. Your family traditions are also a great time to have fun together. But you can also use them as opportunities for the family to recommit to its values, revisit its mission statement, tell stories, and build and grow your interpersonal relationships. And finally, don't forget that every single person in the family is an individual. Use one-on-one time to be completely present with the other person. If that's one of your children, let them decide the agenda. Use the time to understand the other person completely and build trust between you. And uh, why did the Coveys call these four things their big rocks? Well, these important things go in the family schedule first. You'll have some work big rocks to slot in too, but when these are all in place, it's much easier to see where the smaller rocks can fit into your busy schedules. Habit four of seven. Think win-win. Life is filled with winners and losers. In the world of sport, for example, there can only be one winner of the NFL Super Bowl. But there's no reason why in a family setting there needs to be winners and losers. Win-lose, lose-win, and lose-lose situations create at least one loser, and nobody likes to lose, least of all within a family. 
When we engage in win-lose battles, we're only out for ourselves. We no longer care about what is right, only about who is right. And we fight over who's the best, creating a huge negative impact on our family's culture. When we think win-win, our fourth habit, we adopt an abundance mentality. There's plenty to go around for everyone. A win for one family member becomes a win for the entire family. You begin to think in terms of we and not me. And this creates trust, mutual benefit, and positive outcomes. Covey uses a powerful metaphor to describe how to build mutual trust in relationships. He calls it the emotional bank account. Just like a bank, you can make deposits and withdrawals. When you do something that builds trust, you make a deposit. When you do something that reduces trust, you make a withdrawal. When the balance of your emotional bank account is high, there's a high level of trust, which is also an indication of a high level of communication. So, how can you make deposits? Start by doing little acts of kindness. Contrary to what you might think, it's these little acts and deeds that build the most lasting trust. Then, always apologize sincerely when you mess up. Lame excuses or blaming others for your misdeeds result in a huge withdrawal. Also, don't talk about people behind their backs or gossip about them in their absence. Such actions break the trust between you and the person you're talking about and also break the trust between you and the person you're talking to. After all, if a person is willing to talk about one person behind their back, perhaps they'll also do the same behind yours. When families make and keep promises to each other, they know that they can trust each other to do what they say. Breaking a promise also breaks that trust, and it can take months of good behavior to repair. And finally, remember to forgive. Forgiving each other creates channels through which love and trust flow. Habit five of seven, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Ask any family counselor what the top complaint they hear from their clients is, and you'll invariably hear the same answer, poor communication. In the classic book, The Little Prince, the fox observes that it is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. He has a point. Seeking to understand another family member's heartfelt feelings creates a huge deposit in our emotional bank account. So it's no wonder that our fifth habit is to seek first to understand and then to be understood. The key to understanding is listening. Yet often we only pretend to listen, nodding our heads while checking our social media. Or we listen selectively, trying to catch the main points rather than giving the other person our undivided attention. It's only when we use attentive listening that we really start to give the speaker the time they deserve, focusing on every word and being attentive to their body language too. But there's yet another higher level of listening we need to practice, empathic listening. Empathy requires us to do our utmost to see the world from the speaker's viewpoint. When emotions are involved and trust has been broken and deep feelings are being communicated, we need to set aside distractions and use all our senses to listen. And most of all, we need to listen with our hearts, just as the fox said. When you listen in this way, don't judge or evaluate. Hold off on giving advice, too. Jumping in with your worldly wisdom often means you've failed to understand the other person at all. Keep any probing questions to a minimum. Allow the other person to speak rather than, perhaps inadvertently, leading them toward a possible solution. Instead, ask clarifying questions to confirm the accuracy of what you've understood. Such questions demonstrate your desire to understand while generating trust. When you fully understand the other person, you're in a position to give feedback and share your own feelings and viewpoint within their frame of reference rather than your own. That's why, logically, and then be understood comes after seek first to understand. Habit six of seven, synergize. The sum of one plus one can equal three, or perhaps more. No, I didn't flunk basic math. There really are situations where this is kind of true. 
Okay, example. When two people are put on a project to work together, if they have conflicting views on how to complete it, then the result is probably going to be less than if one of them worked on the project alone. Let's say the sum of their achievement would be equal to one half. If they compromise, as in each side gives way a little to the other, then they might even get a result of one and a half. And if they use teamwork and combine their efforts, they'll achieve a result of two. But, and here's where the magic starts, if they synergize their efforts and each person brings their own strengths to the party and their unique talents and ideas, they can come up with better ideas and solutions than the sum of what they could achieve individually. And that would be a result of three or even more. When you practice and develop synergy, you'll find that there's no more my way or your way, but rather our way, a better, higher alternative way. There's more creative cooperation too, and each family member's strengths and weaknesses become irrelevant. Your family will face challenges and opportunities that come their way together and at a much higher level. Habit 7 of 7. Sharpen the saw. Imagine you and a neighbor are sawing down similar dead trees in your yards. You have the same age and physical build and the same saws. You begin at the same time. You stop after a few hours to rest, but your neighbor stopped for a break every hour. Wait a minute, what's this? His tree is nearly cut through, whereas you're only halfway. How's that even possible? You ask, and your neighbor reveals that every time they took a break, they also sharpened their saw. Naturally, they were then able to cut through the tree faster. The seventh and final habit is then to sharpen the saw. Or in other words, taking the time to renew four key areas in your family life. Physical, social and emotional, mental, and spiritual needs. Failure to attend to or renew these areas eventually results in deterioration. So it's essential that both individually and as a family, you set aside time for renewal. Try some of these ideas each day or find some of your own. Physically, try exercising more or eating healthier food. For your social-emotional needs, what about building some new friendships and finding ways to reduce stress levels? Mentally, why not try reading more or starting a new hobby? And spiritually, give meditation a go or read inspirational literature. And when it comes to the family, use some of those big rock times we talked about earlier. Family meal times and one-on-one -on -one bonding times are excellent opportunities to sharpen the saw together. And of course, family vacations are a fantastic opportunity for family activities, as are activities that involve the extended family. Sharpening the saw together helps your family develop its sense of identity, deepen its connectivity, and provide you all with a shared sense of hope. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground in our blink to The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families by Stephen R. Covey. The thing to remember from this is that the key to succeeding as a highly effective family doesn't lie in the practice of any singular habit, but rather in learning and using each habit to make a difference. So let's quickly recap those habits. Habits one to three, be proactive, begin with the end in mind, and put first things first. So to be highly effective, you got to provide your family with a mindset, a sense of destination, and a recognition of its priorities. Then habits four to six were think win-win, seek first to understand, then to be understood, and synergize. So provide a structure and process for your family to work together to accomplish its goals. And finally, Habit 7, Sharpen the Saw, describes the power of renewal your family needs to keep doing to remain highly effective. Learning these habits is an ongoing activity. Think of it as climbing a spiral staircase, each step representing one habit. When you move from step 7 to 8, effectively you start over with step 1 again and so on. Each time you restart the habits, you're at a higher level and better place to apply each habit to even more areas of your life. And finally, here's some more actionable advice. Start with yourself. You can think of working with the seven habits as concentric circles. You are the innermost of these circles. 
When you start with yourself, the effects ripple out, touching each relationship until they reach everyone in your family and perhaps even your community. But where to begin? Well, you got to be honest with yourself and think about one thing you could stop or start doing that would have a huge impact on your family and work on that. Make a simple plan for how you'll keep your commitment to change over the next 30 days or so. Then share your plan with someone who will help you achieve it through their encouragement and tips and who can celebrate your progress with you. When you first worked on yourself, you can then move outward, applying the habits to one specific family relationship and then to the whole of your family. And finally, your family could think about how using the habits could improve your whole community. Hey, thank you so much for listening. And if you care to, let us know what you thought of our blink to The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by rating it and leaving any other feedback that you'd maybe like to share. And if you haven't done so already, you might want to check out our blink to The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You know, the original. Um, so yeah, thanks again and see you in the next blink. Bye. Bye.